Okay, so since I started my career, and that goes back to the mid-90s, I have always been obsessed by software design. And, and back then, when I joined the industry, we used to learn a lot of uh, software design uh, in, in university, in computer science. And also, when we were working in projects, we were doing a lot of waterfall. And it was also the early days of the rational unified process. How many of you work with uh, RUP, or rational unified process? Quite a few hands. Yeah, you are as old as me, at least. So back then, we were forced to design, right? It was part of our process. As we were starting any project, uh, after the, the initial analysis, so there would be a lot of uh, business analysis at the beginning, and then we were forced. It was part of our process that we would stop and design. The problem is that we would design forever, right? We are going to go for months just designing stuff. So that was a mistake, I think. And so I'm just like waiting for a little bit because there's uh, still quite a lot of people coming in. So, so yeah, so we, would, we, would, we were forced to design, and we had to design at many different levels. We had to design at architecture level, at component level, at class level. We had static design, we had dynamic design with sequence diagrams and things like that. The mistake we've made was to overdo it. So we've done too much of it, and we would uh, come up with artifacts, right? So then we have a plan. And then we would start development. And of course, that as we, we all know, as you start developing, you will uncover a lot of problems, and that design is not so suitable. And then we did not have a lot of room to adjust the design. Either we had to stick with it, or just forget about it and do something else. So we learned from it. And then said, people said, oh, you know what? You don't need to design all these things up front. You don't need all these diagrams. You don't need all these, these uh, things, all these artifacts that we had at the unified process. So we should do things more in a more agile fashion. And, and, and as it happens uh, with everything, so when you are too much in one side and you want to counter this side, you, you tend to push all the way to the other side, right? So, so over time, what I see now is that architecture became a bad word, right? So if you talk about architects or architecture, it's bad. Designing at larger scale, it's bad. So, but now we went all the way up to the no design at all. So I've seen many and many teams and projects where they have these big monoliths, and they didn't start 20 years ago. Some of them did, but there's quite a few monoliths that started five years ago. And I think that a lot of these, uh, these problems that we're finding in software design is because we, we are losing the skill to design. I speak to a lot of uh, developers within our company and outside. So younger developers, younger than me at least, and, and they are not used to design anymore. They are used to speak to product owners, talk about the, the, the product backlog, get the user story, and say, now that we have the user story, let's define some acceptance criteria, and let's code that user story. And we are losing the, 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 the big picture. So the problem that we have is, so if we cannot do all the way, all the upfront design, uh, and no design at all is also bad because no design at all is leading to complications. All of a sudden, if you go for too long without designing, you have a mess. And then recover from that mess becomes very, very hard. So what is the middle ground? So the, the, the problem that, I, that we were facing is how much do we design and when do we design? Right? So, so that's, that's what is, this talk is about that. And before I, uh, I, I start, I also want you to mention that this talk is not about a prescription. I'm not giving you a prescription. So what I did, I selected some of the techniques that we use at different stages of a project. And I'm going to talk about those techniques. But they are not the only ones that we use. Not, we don't use all of them in every project. So I just want to make sure that all of you understand that the, I just put it as a sequence. But that should not be interpreted that way. right? So. Okay, uh, so before I start, I would like to talk about bias. So bias, an inclination or prejudice for or against someone or something in a way that is considered unfair. So, and what does it have to do with this talk is because I think that we all have software design biases. So what do I mean by that? 
Imagine like it's similar to, to a, pro, uh, a programming language. So project after project, let's say we pick a language that we like, and then at the beginning we struggle with it, right? So it's a bit hard. We Google a lot, we go to Stack Overflow. So, so but after, project after project, we get better at it, right? Because we like that language, we push that language, we start using more and more and more. We get better at it. The more we, we get familiar with it, we know its quirks. We twist and bend the language. And then we, as we move along, as we get more experience, we can fit any problem in that language. Right? So we can solve almost anything with it. And software design is almost the same as well. So we come up with a few ideas to software design. So this type of design is great. And we start trying to push that in every single project, in every single phase of the project. And at some point, you bend it here and then, and then it will work somehow. And as you get more and more confident in that design, you start thinking that that design is great because you can make it work. And the more confident you get, the more you start rejecting other design styles. So to the point that you consider them bad, right? So I'm going to give you a few examples. So for example, I call them structural bias, or you can call it structural design styles, right? So why do I call them structural? It's because the, it's the structure of your code. It's the structure of your software. So we had some different ones. So this talk is not about talking about which one is better or worse, because that's not the point at all. It's just to explain there are different styles. And so for example, the procedural one. Uh, procedural, you normally code sequentially. You take a business requirement and you just go bang, bang, bang. The user needs to do this, then that, then that, then that. You are not really worried about modeling the domain and, and creating reusable components. It's basically like going one after another and following, okay, that's what I need to do, that's the requirements, bang, 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 that's my code does, blah, 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 blah. So, so that's normally how you go about in the procedural way. On the data side, it's slightly different. So I, when I started, I, I when I, when I went to university in 1994, there was a lot of focus on data. So before we started the project, we would focus like on the data. How would we model the data? And entities and relationships, one to many, many to many, all this kind of stuff. So you would come up with a data model first, which is a static view of your system, and then the entities would emerge from the data model. And then the, the, business, would, the business layer or the, the business logic would be away from the entities, and then we would go uh, to the uh, UI and stuff. The object design is also different. So normally when I learned it, we would go to the uh, requirement documents and would lo look for uh, nouns and verbs. So first of all, you search for the nouns. Those nouns would become the centerpiece of your domain. And then you plug the verbs in, and then the, mess the objects send messages to each other to communicate. So on the functional style, you think about uh, a series of transformations, right? So you go from smaller modules, and then you compose them to become more, comp uh, more complex modules, and you isolate side effects, uh, and I.O., and things like that. So um, on the service, it's very different. So the service focus on the behavior first, right? So data will, similar to functional, oh, in the functional style, you move away from entities. You treat everything as more as a data structure. Uh, on the service, we also focus directly on the behavior first, and then you think about the data. So, and the events, of course, some of the people that like event-driven, the events become the centerpiece of your domain. So then you have events here and there uh, all over your domain. And then the focus would be to decouple, right? So to make things decouple. So the, the, the interesting thing about this is that you can take any of those structural uh, design styles and write any software with them. It will be a little bit harder or, or easier, depending on what you are doing, but you can. But the interesting thing is that if you have a monolith, the, the structural design style you choose has a huge impact. Because for example, if I come from, uh, I don't know, our OO style, and someone wrote the, the whole code base in a functional style, it won't be easy for me to read. Right? I'll need to adapt my, my, my brain. And depending on how biased I am towards one design, I might reject it completely. I'll say, like, this is shit. Like, I, I don't like it. it. It is just wrong. So why the behavior is not with the data? Why are they separate? Or vice versa. So, so this kind of stuff. So if you have a big application, the type of structure design you choose has a much bigger impact. But if you have a distributed application with a lot of microservices, this has a smaller impact. Right? So, 
And when you talk about higher levels of design, I won't go into the detail because that's not the point of this talk, uh, but there are also different uh, design styles or uh, biases, if you like. There are the operational ones where you are worried about logging and security and, and throughput and stuff like that, and some people are really obsessed with it. Any, of course, that any significantly interesting application, at any mid-size application, uh, will have some strong operational and architectural um, needs, and you need to design for it, you need to architect for it, but some people sometimes are way too biased towards them, and that really bleeds into your business design, if you like. Um, so, and then you, you, yeah, so people will try to push CQRS and event source, for example, right, even when you don't need them. Um, but that's, those are not the ones that I want to talk about. The ones that I, that I want to talk about is the directional design. This is a little bit counterintuitive, uh, not counterintuitive, but it's not something that we don't talk too much. This is an orthogonal concept to the other ones, right? You can do any, all the other ones alongside some of those. The design direction is the direction that you choose to design. So given you have a problem, where do you start your design? So the persistence base, similar to the data one, it goes straight to the data, the data and the persistence layer. You figure out your database and the structure of the data, and then you come into the domain model or the business logic. Like if you think about a three-tier application, just to make it easier, uh, the persistence application and user interface. So you go to the persistence, then you go to the application layer, and then the, the, the presentation or the user interface. So that is a, a direction that you go about design. Then the, the most common one, I believe that uh, a lot of people nowadays, they would focus on the domain first, right? And that's what we call the inside out. So we go to the, the core domain first, we analyze all the, the business requirements, we come up with our bounded context or uh, our components, and then we look at our uh, domain, our core domain, and then we move outwards, like to, towards the persistence or towards the, the integrations, towards the, the user interface. Uh, the user interface, I had a lot of projects, many uh, UI reach or a lot of mobile, where people would design all the screens up front. You design all the user journeys up front, and then we had to code from there, right? So that's a direction as well. So again, I'm not here to say the pros and cons of some of them, uh, but I'm biased as well, of course. Uh, and I want to talk about the incremental outside in. Direction-wise, is similar to the user interface. It starts from outside, but the difference is that it's not focused on the UI itself, it's focused on the user journeys, right? It's the service that you're providing to the external world. This is what uh, the, um, the incremental outside in. And also, it focuses on slicing the domain uh, in vertical slices. So, what is important to say is that those design styles are not mutually exclusive. And we should not pick just one uh, as the, 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 the only thing we do. So each one of those design styles, they complement each other. They are different perspectives on the same problem. So for example, uh, if you want to, to do outside in, uh, that doesn't mean that you should not look at your data. Right? So understanding how your data is going to be persisted and structured is part of your design. Right, so if you are coming from, from outside in, it's also important to, to, to understand that you need to split the layers and put the responsibilities in the right place. So maybe uh, separating the core domain from the, the, the delivery mechanism or the user interface is probably a good idea. So what I'm trying to say is that you need to take multiple perspectives on your design in order to design something meaningful. However, some of the design perspectives they take precedence. They are slightly more important than others. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. So, how many of you focus on the domain first? Everyone is worried, ah, should I raise my hand or not? Don't know what he's gonna say next, right? So, this is what I've been doing for a long time. Uh, there is a problem with this. So. Well, the advantage is, is that you focus on the core domain first. So like, let's focus on what is important. But the domain-driven approach will uh, relegate, or they will treat as persistence and the, the, the user interface as second-class citizens, right? As things that you plug in. 
right? So if that changes, it doesn't matter because my domain is protected. So it talks about hexagonal architecture. It's a great uh, example uh, that a lot of people use. Everything that is domain model is within my hexagon, and then I have ports and adapters that I plug in all the dependencies that I have. So of course, there are loads of people who disagree with me, and that's OK. Uh, the problem is, from this perspective, persistence and UI are uh, replaceable. From a user's perspective, the domain is, is so the internals are uh, uh, replaceable. From a system admin or person in operations, the internals are uh, replaceable. So, but the main problem here is that I found that when we are just focusing on the domain first, there's nothing to constrain our domain because we are building something that we are not quite sure how it's going to be used. And then there is a lot of, um, how can I say, um, speculative design. You speculate that you're going to have this component, and then at some point when I plug in my, my, my UI or my user journey, it will just fit. Do you have any UX mobile developers or front-end developers in the room? A few hands. So the problem that w what we do is, because normally back-end developers do the, the core domain, right? So then we get obsessed with our domain. So wow, look how beautiful this domain model is. And then you have the people that actually need to consume that. There are the, front, the, the UX people, the front-end people, the mobile people. So they, 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 they have a need. I said, I don't care about your need. My, my, my core domain is far more important. So I will give you some APIs for you to call me. And then I say, but that's not what I want. Don't care. That's your APIs. Yeah, but it's too coarse grain or too fine grain or I need to make multiple calls or blah, blah, blah. Don't care. So, oh, but then you need to reach an agreement, right? So, and then you go for this discussion. But always the backend people, because they are so obsessed with their domain, they push how the domain is going to be used. And then what we do? We create these horrendous adapter layers because our domain is so precious that I don't want it to be polluted by the needs of the front end. So let's create this maxim, uh, big accidental complexity, create these adapter layers so that the front end people that we don't care about uh, do their thing without touching my domain. And I think that this is a very selfish way of looking at software design. Software design should exist to satisfy the external world, right? We build systems to satisfy the external world. That is our job. A software design should enable uh, all the actors that interact with the systems, being customers or internal actors or operations people, to use what we are building, right? So, so we should provide software for them. So that leads us to over-engineering or under-engineering. So where do you design? So normally, I have like a, a, the way that I split things in my head is all the blue lines, that means how the different deployable units talk to each other. This is what I call architecture. Databases, protocols, communication, APIs, this is for me all, all architecture. Within each deployable unit, I divide in two levels of design. One is what I call macro design. Macro design is the, the, the overall structure of your system. You're going to separate the, the, the delivery mechanism from your core domain, or you're going to have hexagons, you're going to have components, you're going to have an infrastructure layer. So this, this high level structural design is what I call macro design. And then within the macro design is where the classes come in, the, the group of the, the aggregates and stuff like that. That's what I call micro design. I believe that a lot of the systems that we call over-engineered, they are over-engineered in the micro, but under-engineered on, on the architecture level. We see this big ball of m big systems very complex, but the reason they are complex is because they are just one big block. So the problem is, if you want to engineer at, or to architect at the higher level, we are losing those skills, and we are sometimes using the same skills that we that we design on the micro to design the architecture level. So 
my view is that our systems are way more complex now, and I believe that most people now would agree that uh, having a single uh, deployable unit is a bad idea for all the reasons that you already know. I won't go into to, to that here to repeat, but like, so we want to split, right? Have different systems doing with very specific roles so we can deploy them independently, continuous deployment, all that kind of good stuff, which means that if we are moving towards a distributed architecture now, our design, our core domain, cannot be the one inside the hexagon anymore. Because now what we have is multiple hexagonals talking to each other. So domain modeling needs to step up, needs to go one level up. So we need to start designing the services first, and then the internals. The internals are far less relevant nowadays. So, but if you want to do a strategic design, that I call, we have a problem. Because if you want to, to design strategically and separate these functional areas of the business, we need to see a little bit beyond than the user story. A lot of agile teams now, we have the, 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 we have the illusion that we are in, working a close collaboration with business, but we are not. There is a whole world of things that happens in product design that we are completely unaware. So they are doing their investigation, their user research, uh, loads of things, and then they come up with the portfolio of, of products that they want, they come up with a product roadmap, they come up with milestones, and when we interact with them, our intersection normally is the top stories of the backlog. That's when we start talking. Of course, I'm giving in general. There are teams that are far tighter and teams that are far, far away. Uh, but in general, what I see a lot is the development team talks to the product owner to discuss the top items, and they complain if the product owner didn't prioritize or, or wrote the, the acceptance criteria. So then when we look at it, then we will just focus on the next user stories for that iteration. Or, so this view is too limited if you want to architect systems. It doesn't give us enough visibility for us to make wider uh, architectural decisions. So we need to, 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 to change that. So for me, the goal of software design is to enable companies to continue to achieve their business goals. So what does it mean? So design is a means to an end. So it needs to be flexible and robust. This is a, 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 a problem because you need to design in a way that is flexible enough but robust enough to go to production every time you finish a feature. But for example, it should enable the, the, the short and long term goals. So this is not easy. Those are skills. Designing systems that is flexible and robust, that should allow small changes, but also uh, be stable enough for you to keep going. Those are skills that are not common anymore. So, and we also need to enable, so for example, a design is not only about maintaining system. Before we said, oh, a good design will help developers to maintain the system. That's way too limited for a vision of software design. Software design should enable people to work in parallel, should enable to, to collaborate, should enable the business to deploy software to production multiple times a day. Software design should enable different actors to maintain the systems in production, to very quickly know what's going on. So there's a lot, software design is far more important than just we focusing, uh, maintain a few classes or functions, right? So software design is far more strategic than that. It enables the business uh, to become more agile. So, so going back to how much do we design and when? I need to rush because I'm, uh, I'm losing a lot of time. So, First of all, when you come up with a domain model, it's very difficult to know how useful it is if you don't know how it's gonna be used. We can say that this domain model is very robust according to what we, our understanding, but is it useful? And that's a very different question. Very different question, right? So, so let's say, for me, design should start all the way from outside, but outside the company, thinking about the customers, how they're gonna use all the different actors that we're gonna have. So what are we building? Who are our customers? What is the business vision? Where are we going with this, right? So, so this will help us at a very high level to understand what is the vision of the product. So then a lot of complex systems, they have far more internal actors than external. Sometimes you have a customer that is buying something, but you have a whole bunch of people, call center, warehouse, distribution, marketing, loads of people internally that are also actors in the system. 
And we not always design systems thinking about all the internal actors. So understanding the different functional areas is also very important, because it will help us to modularize our system. And then, once we understand that, we need to create the services that will map that. And then, we inside each service, and then each class. So there are many different layers or levels of design that we need to model, but then, how much do we design, and when? So, so here I'm gonna show just a few techniques, again, in each one of those levels of design, you can use many different uh, techniques. I'm just gonna show some of them that, that we use a little bit more than others. So, imagine that you have different levels of abstraction in design, right? So one is like, what is this product about? What are the main features, right? Once we understand that, we need to come up with a, with a product roadmap. We need to come up with milestones. Each milestone will have a set of features. Each feature will have a set of user stories. So it takes a while from the big picture to when we start coding. And we need to help the business to design at all levels. So let's focus on the product design first, right? So what is the goal of oh, product box, sorry? So normally, uh, in product design, you go through phases. They're, they're, they should be uh, cyclic, right? It's not just like a, a waterfall thing. But there is a phase called ideation, right? It's when the business is trying to come up with an idea for a product. And, and at that point, they are gonna do a lot of market research, user research, they will do a lot of things, right? So, and then, we are not normally not involved in there, but we should, because we have something to contribute. So for example, in the product box, uh, exercise is basically you, you go to the business and say like, let's imagine that we are white labeling our product and selling to someone else to use. What would be the main features that we would announce? And you try to ask them to condense just the main features. So this is a real uh, thing that we've done with one of our clients a long time ago. So for example, they said they are an e-commerce. Uh, so they said, well, those are the core features. So we have omnichannel, we have catalog management, multi-warehouse, product supplier. So this took three hours to get in there. We had a few people, marketing, CEO, and CTO, and everyone else, until we got down to this list. Why is this important? So this is at the very high level, because when you look at those things, you can very quickly extract what we call functional areas. Once you have those areas, you in your design, you need to think about them being independent. You don't want to, to change one and break the other. So normally there are different uh, f uh, people in the business that will be uh, responsible for those things as well. Another important thing that we should be providing to the business when they are coming up with a product design, a product idea, is just like, what, what do we need to build? What, should, what we can buy? Is there a product out there that we could uh, reuse? What do we need to integrate? So those things allows us very quickly to build an architectural vision for the project and also provide that feedback to the business, right? So this is the high level, the first, uh, how can I say, uh, attempt to come up with a strategic design or architecture, right? So the goal of this, right, uh, so you can help the, with this conversation, business, business and technology, you can help the business. Instead of them creating a product uh, uh, roadmap out of the blue with no information, if we provide the cost, the high level cost of what to build, what to buy, what to integrate, we can help them to come up with a more realistic product roadmap and potential milestones, right? So, so let's assume that we've done that and now we have a an idea for a product roadmap, right? So next step, what we can do is, so now we have milestones, right? So let's assume that we have milestones. So then, so we have a high level design, we know what the function, main functional areas are, and then we say, okay, let's now focus on the next three months, let's say, on the next milestone. So how do the business prioritize? How do, so before we, take, we pick the user story at the top of the backlog, how that backlog is even created? How is it prioritized? We should be helping that instead of complaining later. So how can we help them? So well, impact mapping is a technique that I like a lot. Uh, so what we can do is to say, so let's focus on the next milestone and create a goal for it. So we had a client that came to us 
and, he asked, and, and they asked this, this kind of questions. It's like, I would like your help to come up, like to, I, we, they had uh, investors, and the investors wanted assurance that they knew what they were doing. So what they should build in the next few months? Which features would give us a higher impact? So how do we then find bounded context in high-level architecture? So how do we enable teams to work in parallel? How, how should we plan an act, uh, uh, how, how do we show a plan of action to our stakeholders? How do we reduce dependency and plan for continuous delivery? So all of that is the responsibility of software design. Software design should enable those things, right? So impact mapping is interesting because what you do is you define a goal. So this is the goal for our next three months. So then the next level, so this is a workshop that we technology can run with our business to help them, to bring everyone together. So once we have the goal for the iteration, we say, like, who are the actors that could contribute towards that goal, internal and ex external? And then what is the impact? What is the behavior that we would like those people or systems to have in order to contribute to that goal? And then up until the third level is all business. And then the, the fourth level is the actual things that you need to build or do in terms of software development. So then you have like a bunch of things that we need to do in software to enable a behavior for an actor to contribute to the goal, right? So I'm going to show you uh, a real example of an old thing that we've done as well. Uh, so we were working with this startup, and they so their goal was to. Uh, get a lot of users. So there was user acquisition and retention, right? So they don't exist anymore, not because of us, so not because of our device, but like, so, so it's safe. I can show to you the, the real uh, case. So they were in the, the, the music industry. They want to create a music platform. So basically the goal was acquisition and retention of users. So there were two main actors. I'll forget about the other three. So there were the fans, the people that like music, and then there were the artists. So when you think about uh, retain, uh, acquiring and retaining users, so then we would say, what are the behaviors that we would like those two actors to have so that it would contribute to the goal? And then you can see, for example, uh, there are sign up uh, and referring friends. Those are related to user acquisition, right? So, but then once you acquire the user, they need to come into the platform and do something, otherwise they're gonna go away and never come back. So listening to music is something that is retention. So all of a sudden, you start creating those behaviors, and then for some an artist. So they want to choose uh, an artist, they want to sign contracts, sign deals with very famous artists and give them incentives, financial incentives or whatever, to publish uh, exclusive content in their platform. So imagine someone very, very famous going to their social network platforms, like their Instagram and Twitter, whatever, and say, hey, I have this new song or this new single, and by the way, it's only available in this platform. A single tweet like that would bring thousands of users. So, so then all of a sudden, you start having a conversation with business and technology and different parts of the business as well. You start aligning the business and everyone in the room towards the goal. So now we have a way to prioritize that. And then we start talking about all the, the different kind of things that we need to do in software. We need to build a player, we need to create this, we need to create that. So all of a sudden, now we can have a sensible discussion for the next three months, what are the most valuable features towards our goal, and this will allow us to create a, a, a better backlog moving forward. But there is something a little bit more interesting as well. So this, this is, is a huge thing. So as we were doing that, we said like, but this is becoming too complex. Let's try to bundle that into buckets and see how they look like. So as we were doing the other side, we were grouping those features into functional areas. And all of a sudden, this exercise helped us to not only come up with the, the sequence of features that we had to, to build according to the value and stuff, but also, on the other side, the architectural layers or functional areas. And when I say functional areas, uh, think about bounded context. Very similar thing. I just prefer the, the term functional areas. I think it's a better term. But it's the same thing that bounded context would be. So this allows us to understand if we pick one feature, what bounded context or functional area will be affected? 
who could work on it. So can, can you pick things that would be decoupled so, so they can evolve differently? So can we attack those things differently as well? Because different bounded contexts or functional areas in here, we have a very different uh, architecture. One might use Elasticsearch and caches and stuff. The other one might use a completely different technology. So we are now collaboratively creating a backlog and we, are not, we, we have enough visibility of what's coming next and we now can become a little bit more strategic when you start a new feature. Should I put this new feature in an existing service or should we start creating a brand new one according to the business that we know? And the cool thing is that we are now not creating random services. We are now modeling the whole system with business terms. So the business language is coming down all the way. I need to run because I'm going to run out of time very quickly. So once we have a milestone and we are going, I'm sorry, this is what we're going to do next. What we will have is a set of features that will be in that milestone. So we need to come up one level down. By the way, this is not upfront design. This, those, those things take a few hours to do, right? So it's not like we are spending months doing that. This is just a few hours. So then now we have a, a bunch of features that we want to achieve in the next three months. We need to go to the lower level of detail. We need to validate how those things, what would be the user journeys, internal and externals, right? So as soon as we have users coming into the system, how we are, what is the journey and which functional areas you're going to be involved? So this is the, another refinement, another level of refinement. So I'm going to show you an example. Um, this is the e-commerce uh, client. We went to them and said, so when the user comes in to your home page, what happens? Oh, they see the catalog. So this was an exercise with all the product owners, uh, the teams, and everyone else. So, oh, that's great. So what is a catalog? Oh, catalog is uh, a list of products and prices and pictures and stuff. Okay. But are they all products? No. So when you come in, it's a subset. So basically, if you are in one country, it will show you a list of products. If you are a different country, it will show a different uh, list of products. And then there is all the whole summer, uh, winter, all the, the, the clothes and stuff. So, and then I said, OK, so if they are not all products, who creates the catalog? Oh, there are some fashion experts that will take the list of products, and they will condense that to a catalog. So fashion experts is one internal actor that will interact with the system from the back end to create a catalog. And those are different catalogs across the world. So this is an important thing. So where does the products come from? Oh, products. Products, there is a, a bunch of people that deal with factories all over the world that they produce all those, those products. Oh, so the people that come up with a product list are not the same creating the catalog. And then we start asking those questions repeatedly. So they said, well, so how do you decide what you display? Is it just the selection? No, it's not only the selection of the, 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 the fashion experts. We also need to understand for them if the product is available in that region. We have a lot of warehouses, uh, and then different warehouses serve different countries. Sometimes you have multiple warehouses per country. Sometimes you have one warehouse for multiple countries. So all of that is part of the availability criteria. Some of the products cannot be sold in certain countries because they are either too expensive or they because of the local preferences, they are not suitable for the local markets. All of that comes into the availability side. Pricing. It's like, how do, how do you define pricing? Oh, we have pricing experts that their job is to figure out what is the price for the same product in different countries. So those are different internal actors, in, again. And the tax. And then what about the photos and the videos for each product? Well, there is a, a studio people that focus on that because some of the, the, the dresses or, or shirts or whatever, depending on how the model wears them, that can be a bit more offensive or less offensive in different countries. So you need to have a different set of uh, things. So all of a sudden, just analyzing a single user journey, just going to the web page, we discovered a lot of internal actors. All those people need access to the system. So understanding that uh, uh, helps you to architect your system. Another interesting question is who owns the data? Who owns product data? Who owns catalog data? Who owns the media data? Who owns the pricing data? They are different pieces of data that they need to reuse each other or they need to be uh, put together 
but we want to have data ownership in your services. And that's potentially through the actors. So it's a fascinating exercise that you give you a very strategic view just coming from outside and analyzing the, the flow. So the cart is the same. So this was a fascinating exercise. So we had two clients. So every now and again, they would come up with promotions. The first question is who come up with the promotions? Oh, there is the marketing people that are responsible for promotions and sales. So another internal uh, user. Sometimes it's the same person with different hats. Sometimes are full departments, depending on the size of your organization. And then there were requirements like, if I add a product to my shopping basket or to my cart, and this, pro this product is in, is in uh, sales, and the sales ends, what happens? Let's say that I add but don't buy. Should we keep the, 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 the promise of the sales, or should we invalidate the cart or that product? One client wanted to keep the promise. The other one wants to, to invalidate. So this created, the one that wanted to keep the promise, create a hell to structure that. Because like some products that were there, then they said, OK, but now a different product is, 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 in, uh, is in on sales, and then there are combinations of products, and never worked properly. But we couldn't cover those things. And then I can go on. But then, for example, this one is interesting, the checkout page. We need to show the, the content of the card. We need to show the delivery options. Oh, that's easy. No, it's not, because different countries have different delivery options. They're not the same for every country. For a delivery option to be available, there are people at the back signing contracts with different local companies to do the delivery. So there's a lot of contractual work that goes on. So that is also another functional area. And the way that is assembled is also interesting. For example, the checkout page needs to show the cards, the delivery options, the payments, the payment options. Payment options, the same thing. Different countries, different payment options, different payment gateways, all contracts that need to be signed behind the scenes, everything else. So what do we, how do we assemble all this data? Should we go to the page and the page make multiple calls to different functional areas and then display everything together so that the, 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 the joining of this data is done in the front end and then we will provide a lot of fine-grained APIs? Or should we provide just a single service at, at, in front of it that would call all the other services and then provide the whole data? So all of those are architectural decisions that are extremely important, but you need to base those decisions in something. And that's a way of doing that. There are asynchronous, asynchronous things, but I won't go there. But what is interesting is, once you are able to take multi related features, you can map those functional areas. So now we have in green, for example, all the, the functional areas that are client-facing, that they need public API. And you have other functional areas that are not client-facing. So are we going to apply security the same way? Normally we should. Normally you apply security regardless if it's client-facing or not. We apply the same. But this gives us a, an idea what is public, what is not. Also, that, there is that, that thing that sometimes is a clear cut. Payments and products are very separate things. I would not have a service where both logics are together. But other things are not so clear cut. So the, the catalog, media, and product, uh, I don't know. So for example, we can have a, a sensible debate. It's like, should tax and pricing be together? Should delivery and distribution be together? Should catalog and product and media be together? So in doubt, when you want it, now we know what the function areas are. And now we need to decide, would we create them as separate services, separate deployable units, or they are too chatty, they talk too much, and there's not a clear division. So let's cr have them as functional areas, but together in a single deployable unit. And then we just use macro design with components to separate the two, but deploy them all together. So at least we have something to, to base our design ideas. And then, once we understand all those uh, communications, the, the user journeys, we still need to get to the more detail. What is the APIs? What's the actual calls? And then, if you have a UI, for example, a technique that you can use is, is mock-ups, right? So let me show you a quick example. Um, so this is, imagine a Twitter application, right? So, so this is a thing that you can do in a few hours with our UX uh, person, your, your product owner, and whoever. Oh, we're going to have a registration or a login. So when you click register, we go to the, the, the feed. Uh, I can find some friends. I can follow someone in here. And then I can post something. And then I can see my, uh, my wall and, and all this kind of stuff. So very quickly, you can put together. You don't need to worry about details. It's just like the flow. It doesn't matter where the links are, right? It's just like what we are going to have and where. 
so once you have that and you agree that, again, this is a few hours to do. Once you have that, what you can do, you can start, wrong button, you can start creating your APIs. And so like when I click register, what should be sent to the, from the browser to my uh, backend and what should come back? So as soon as I come in, so when I try to post, create a new tweet, what should I be sending? What is the API? So if I go to Alice and I see Alice wall, so what would be the data like? So what is the endpoint? So then you can start, now that you agreed what are the interactions that the user is gonna have, you can start creating the APIs that are suitable to that uh, user. And then you might think, but would you not be creating naive domains? Because that's a common question that people that, that like focus on the domain first. We will say, oh, but then you create very specific things and, and your domain will, be, uh, will not evolve nicely. It's similar, the way I see this is similar to test driven development, right? So what you do in TDD? You take one case and so like, uh, write a small test, then you write a class that hard code the result, test is green, done. If that is my only requirement, that's enough code. Ah, but I know there is more. So I add a new test, there's another requirement that that class will evolve to satisfy two cases. I add a third, I add a fourth. As I add more tests, my code goes from specific to more generic. That's how we evolve systems through test-driven development. And this is the same as design. If we create, there is just one API coming to a, a functional area, that functional area needs to be extremely simple and just to satisfy that API. But as I add more APIs, into the same functional area, that the, the internal design of the functional area will need to evolve and become more generic to satisfy multiple cases. And that's when we are gonna use our hexagonal architecture, our uh, tactical building blocks, or whatever else uh, you want to use in terms of macro and micro design. But you wait for the, the calls from outside and you evolve your design. And with that, of course, you can extract your API, you use your swagger or whatever, and now you have a proper conversation with the front end because they were part of that workshop. The UX, front end people, mobile people, back end, we all figured out, and now we have a common API to work from. Go away. And last, once we understand all of that, then you pick your, uh, so at this point, now you know the entry point. You know exactly what your system needs to do to satisfy the external world. You have the overall vision of the product. You have a, an idea of a product roadmap. You have an idea what are the goals for the milestone. You have an idea for all the features. You know, you understand how they relate to each other, all the, 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 the functional areas. You know which APIs need to be provided to the external world. And at that point, then you can pick your closure, your Java, your C Sharp, or whatever. You want to do functional, you want to do OO, you want to do hexagon, you want to split the delivery mechanism from hex. Now it's fine, because now you know that whatever you do within your deployable unit, is be, uh, whatever you do needs to satisfy the need from the external world and then it can evolve as, as you wish. In this case, because I'm coming all the way from outside, for me, according to my biases and my, my preferences, I prefer outside in TDD, right? So then I will just come in, start from my API layer, from my, my delivery mechanism layer, and then I will, from the controller, start coming in into my domain model, and that's when my application service, my domain services, my entities, and everything else will emerge just to satisfy that API, and they will evolve and become more and more generic the more APIs I have coming into that part of my domain. And this way, when you, when you design things this way and you collaborate with a business like that, it's much easier to slice vertically, because if you just focus on your core domain first, I find very difficult to have concrete vertical slices and have continuous delivery or deliver software to production multiple times a day. So that gives you a, a full picture. Again, those are techniques, but what is important is not the techniques themselves, is the layers of design of what you design and when. This is far more important than the techniques. There are uh, uh, many other techniques that you can use. I need to finish because I'm over time now. So just to give you an idea, for a product uh, roadmap or vision, every six to 12 months, you should review that. Are we still in the right direction as a business? 
So impact mapping, every new milestone, three, four months or whatever. As soon as you have a milestone, let's do an impact mapping. Let's figure out what we need to do, what we want to achieve as a business, and derive our uh, backlog from that exercise. Uh, functional mapping, once you have all the features, try to figure out what are the journeys that the user will come in, how they're going to touch all the different functional areas, how they relate. Would, they keep, would we keep the functional areas together in a single service? Would we split them into services? In doubt, put them together. If it's a very clear cut, keep them separate. Uh, if there is a lot of visual stuff, mobile, front end, blah, blah, do some mockups. Figure out what the touch points are. So where, where do we need which information? Derive your APIs from there. And then, of course, then just use your TDD and your favorite structural design to uh, do what you need to do. So where do we go? From here, uh, I think that we need to widen the intersection between business and technology. We, and, and I say we, technology, uh, I consider myself a developer, so we complain that we want to, to go to the business and be part of the group, so we want to integrate more with the business, but they are not interested. And why should they be interested? This is a conversation that I was having with someone outside, but like, uh, for example, imagine there is a, a bunch of product owners, business people and stuff. They are creating their plans. And you come in as a developer and say, I want to be part of the meeting. Yeah, sure, but why? Uh, because I need to understand what I need to do for you. Yeah, I can tell you later. So once we are done, we tell you. So if you want to be closer to the business, you need to have something to offer, right? If you want to be part of a group, it's not that the group needs to accept you. You need to bring something to the table. So we can go to the business and say, I can help you to create a strategy for the business because I can provide you technical knowledge that you don't have that may reshape your ideas, things that we can buy, we can build, we can integrate, information that I will need way up front before we start creating any software. You cannot just say in one week and say, now we need to integrate with a payment gateway. Yeah, do we have a contract signed? Do we have someone on the other side to provide us the API, the support, and everything else? No. So, it, of course, that's not going to happen. So, so we need to help them. We need to provide value. And we can run those workshops that would help them to reshape the product. Hopefully, if I come back next year, I, I'm working on it. I'm trying to define... A, a, it's not a process. It's not a methodology. But, like, the intersection points, right? So, map the, the phases of... Uh, product design to software design. And there are a lot of intersections in there. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still working on it. Hopefully next year, uh, I'll have something more concrete to show. Uh, if you're interested in test-driven development, outside in TDD and Class Assist, that is an eternal discussion which one is better. Uh, Bob Martin and myself, we recorded uh, uh, 14 hours of video where we took like a, uh, that, that example of the, the, the Twitter one. So we created the full front end uh, in React. And then we, ha we had to provide eight APIs. So we started from scratch, create, you know, writing Java, creating eight APIs. I did for the first few hours, and he was pairing with me. Uh, from nothing to a few APIs satisfying the UI. And then we started again uh, doing uh, class C CDG or inside out CDG, where Bob was uh, driving. I was pairing with him. And then once we both were done, we spent the last hour just talking the advantages and disadvantages of each method. So that is Software Craftsmanship, my book. So thank you.